Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings, and today we're talking Dr. Doolittle's Garden, which is book seven of the Dr. Doolittle series. Uh, this, uh, as you can see at the bottom, if you perhaps squint, this is a mobile read edition dating back to 2018. Uh, this book was initially published in 1927. I suspect that this frontispiece has been edited, uh, well, no, I'm pretty darn sure it's been edited because this is, this is an original Hugh Lofting drawing which somebody just whited out in effect, whoever the original publisher was on the edition that they used for this, uh, and scribbled their own mobile read edition thing in. Um, this was initially published in 1927. Uh, so, what we have here, uh, let's take a look at the original cover. Um, this is a weird book. Uh, I mean, they're all weird. Dr. Doolittle is fundamentally weird. Uh, this is an odd book because Dr. Doolittle's Garden feels almost like a placeholder title. In point of fact, this book ends on a cliffhanger, and the next book picks up where this one left off, uh, and in a lot of ways this book is a little bit like the part one of a two-part episode in a TV series, um, because Dr. Doolittle's, all of the previous Dr. Doolittle books kind of, whatever the title was, kind of was the focus, you know, Dr. Doolittle's Zoo is about his somewhat misnamed non-zoological garden, which was, you know, the tiny city for animals that he set up in the back lot acre of his home. Dr. Doolittle's Circus is about when he was at the circus. Dr. Doolittle's Caravan is a continuation of that story, but I suppose caravan is as good a term as any for sort of what was going on there. Um, you know, these the various books focus on the thing that's going on, but Dr. Doolittle's Garden, while much of this story takes place in the garden, much of the story takes place not in the garden. Um, and what you have in this book is a certain continuation of the previous book chronologically to this, that is book four, uh, because we have once again bounced in time, because, uh, you know, the book before this was picking up, was The Caravan, which was picking up right after uh, Circus, but this book is picking up right after Dr. Doolittle's Zoo. So, in Dr. Doolittle's Zoo, we, we have the doctor setting up his his animal city and in this one we just sort of pick up where the animal city was we continue to have the narration by Tommy Stubbins uh, Tommy Stubbins is now no longer the you know boy the 12 year old boy that he was back when we were first introduced to him in book two uh, he is now it's been several years he's in his mid to late teens and he has become Dr. Doolittle's assistant. He's learned animal languages, and he does all of that, you know, secretarial note-taking work that scientists have assistants for. Um, and so, in the course of this story, uh, you know, it's, it's just a certain amount of storytelling from various animals about events in their lives. Um, this is a kind of a spoiler, because at the very end of the book, a ginormous space moth, yes, space moth, it came from the moon. There's a ginormous, they describe it as building-sized moth that lands in the doctor's back garden. So uh, this is the usual illustrations by Hugh Lofting, which I continue to love the silhouette that he has going and his stylization. I just, I just, you know, you know me, 
you know I've been talking about this endlessly. Um, but the doctor tells stories. We have stories like this story where he talks about the, the top knot terrier where a purebred a uh, poodle decides that she's going to winds up having puppies by some random passerby mongrel dog and all of her puppies wind up with these weird puff balls on their heads but when they turn out to be hyper intelligent dogs the doctor basically invents a breed and convinces the duchess that she can just call them a new breed and then everybody wants one because it's a you know, brand new fancy breed. Um, because, as the doctor quite rightly points out, the only reason that dog breeds are a thing is because somebody decided that they liked how a toy poodle looked and declared it to be a thing. Um, uh, and let's be honest, toy poodles are neurotic because they have been bred so many times that their brain chemistry is wonky and also they're small and irritable, so they're just completely neurotic. That's, like, a thing for toy poodles. Uh, and, you know, that's what overbreeding does, is it makes small dogs that are neurotic. Uh, anyways, so we have that. We have... But then we get the doctor's sort of primary driving impetus in this book, and that is he decides he wants to learn how to communicate with insects because communicating with insects is hard you know, it's one thing to learn how to communicate with, you know, a bird that you can see all of its feathers, that it can, you know, tilt its head and squawk and flail its wings, and you can come to some kind of understanding. Insects are so small that there are things that you're not going to be able to see because they're too small for them to, for you to see. And noises that they make that may be too quiet for you to hear. The doctor, however, does eventually manage to start communicating with things like wasps, including the wasp pictured here in this uh, photo, who manages to finally get the doc, who manages to finally explain that his favorite thing is the yellow gooey stuff, and it turns out that the yellow stuff is a particular orange marmalade. Uh, and it turns out that the wasp basically gets drunk if he has too much orange marmalade, so he's, like, constantly, like, passing out in the marmalade. And this is an image of the doctor's white mouse cleaning him off after he had basically nearly drowned in marmalade because he's clearly an addict. Um... And so you get that. You get stories from various bugs, uh, you get, you know, fascinating tales of insects that are carried overseas by, you know, by ducks or geese. Um, the, the, the water bug in question, the water insect in question insists that it's a duck and the doctor, after you know, prodding him for more information, says, oh, it's a goose. It's one of those kinds of geese. Huh. But, and uh, you have some interesting stories from the perspective of a wasp who claims that he won an enormous battle, which he doesn't know the names of anyone involved. They just called them things like bombastic and the exploding side and the so on. Because they're insects and they don't really care about human borders. Uh, they just care about the fact that an army has come stomping around and is squashing all of their wasps' nests. Um, anyways, this image, uh, which is far darker than I thought it would be, uh, I hope you can see it, because um, I'm not sure that there's much I can do in this, is of a tree. And this weird, creepy tree, which I really, really hope you can see. Again, I am thought this was going to be brighter. Um, is an image that is at the point where this becomes a cliffhanger. See, what happens is the doctor is minding his own business, bringing 83 million insects into the house and driving Dab Dab the duck, who remains his housekeeper, up the wall 
in the way that you would get driven up the wall for somebody who insists on bringing buckets of maggots into your home and starts asking people to bring cockroaches into your house. And, you know, she's particularly upset since she has gone to great efforts to make sure there are no insects in the house. And you know, and gets very, very upset when the doctor starts saying, no, we can't clear out the spider's webs. We, that would be unkind to the spiders anyways. Um, and one wonders why the doctor's sister Sarah ran off to marry a clergyman, and the answer would be because she got tired of dealing with just this. Anyway. Uh, so, like, I, as I said at the beginning of this, a house-sized moth lands in the doctor's back garden, carrying a bunch of flowers that are continuing to survive, and they're very, very large. They're like head-sized blossoms that are somehow continuing to survive even though they have been plucked from the ground and produce vast amounts of outbound oxygen. And this book has a frankly harrowing description of Stubbins and the Doctor and uh, Polynesia and Chi Chi the monkey climbing on the back of this uh, moth and taking off for the moon. You see, the reason why you would have those blossoms is so that they can breathe in that airless gap between the earth and the moon. And it's, it's a horrifying description of, of, you know, feeling weightless, of being unable to take your head out of the flower for a moment because, you know, you have your head and mouth face free and yet it's as though somebody had clapped a hand over your mouth and nose and you can't breathe because there's no air in space. And him talking about just being seasick and spinning endlessly in space and, you know not daring to let go because, of course, in theory, you should be, you know, moving at the same speed and so on and so forth as, you know, whatever it is that you were with, but you don't dare let go, and they're, like, just drifting once they get out of the atmosphere, and there's, and he, you know, his nose is bleeding, and it's, it's really, really horrifying. <laughs> Um, you know, and the book ends with them landing on the moon and the doctor spotting a tree in the distance and saying, that's a tree. If there's a tree like this, then there has to be water, which given that he said that he thought that the flowers didn't necessarily need earth water, then I don't know why the tree would, but eh, eh you know, it's the, the, the logic of these books only needs to be so consistent. In any event, the, this book ends on a cliffhanger. It ends with Dr. Doolittle and a parrot and a monkey and Dr. Doolittle's assistant landing on the moon. And that's where the book ends, with the next book being The Doctor in the Moon. Um, and as I said, it's the book meanders a great deal. It, it remains interesting. It remains autobiographical in nature. But it's a strange, strange thing to... It's a strange thing, this book, because as I said, this is, this is just part one. It, it, the story is not remotely over. This isn't like Dr. Doolittle's Circus where it's kind of open-ended. In this point, we're literally just dangling by our fingertips, waiting to find out what happens next. Uh, so I will leave you here and hopefully somebody will come back to find out what happens next or maybe even go read the book. Um, and that's everything and I will see you all next week.